Good morning, Bindigen. Bonjour. Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship at Broadway First Baptist Church. I just have to smile at the uh, wonder that is Kent Gowler and his way of bringing us into, uh, into worship with that prelude, uh, but also into the world with events that happened across the pond uh, in Westminster this week. Thank you, Kent. My name is Raymond Sokolsky, and we are gathered here this Sunday along with Sheila Mitchell Duick, back from Nippon, Japan, hosting our gathering on Zoom with Kent Gowler and Mitch Martin, along with Amy and Leanne, who are raising our spirits in worship with music. We'll also be led by Linda Dick, who will share scripture, and Susan Stevenson and Gay Miller during the Lord's Supper. Pastor Charlene McAlpin will be bringing us the message of how we are called to blessing. So it's finally happened. We have experienced the very first days of double digit temperatures, grazing near 20 degrees after almost six months. Our world here in the Red River and Assiniboine Valleys is springing at last. We are surrounded by bicycles and brooms and rakes and rollerblades and optimistic souls breaking out the shorts. In short, we are transformed, all because of God's faithful design and continuity. And so it's fitting we call to mind relatives whose traditional ways seek relationship with our Creator's design and continuity. Those gathered along Nestawea, those two rivers that lead in three directions, those who have looked after those lands for millennia, the Dene and the Dakota, the Ininawak, the Anishinaabeg, a land they shared with the Red River Métis and with us in treaty. May we grow in relationship, in healing, in trust, and in love with all of our indigenous relations as we try to better reflect God's love for us all. Some announcements before we carry on with our time of worship together. Last night, uh, there was roof raising uh, soul-stirring, secular and sacred, and in some ways really sacredly secular music that was shared uh, from Billy Joel to Mozart, from Liverpool to Ukraine. And it was all in support of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters, and specifically Olena and Anatoly. It was a wonderful time. Uh, you can, I'm sure, uh, with very little prompting, get those of us who were there last night to share with you how joyful it was. It really was joyful. Uh, and if you want uh, to have a part of it, even though you weren't able to be there last night, you can. You can partake of the 800 pounds of goodies that were shared last night, but were not all consumed. So come down to Friendship Hall after the service and partake. But if you also wish to leave behind your show of support, for Anatoly and Olena as they try to um, find a home and stay together here in Canada, then there's an opportunity for you to do that downstairs. There's a flyer to tell you more and envelopes available. So please avail yourselves either way or both ways. I draw your attention to the different ways we are called to present our offerings to the work and maintenance of this faith community. Some of those ways are described in the bulletin. So I ask you as we pray together uh, during the service that you consider what ways that you are being called to share in God's blessing uh, of your time, of your talents, of your tithes. The funeral service for Bill Sturgis, who was a well-loved former pastor here at Broadway First Baptist Church, takes place at 10 a.m. Central Time, that's our time, this Friday, May 12th, that service is originating out of York Minster Park Baptist Church in Toronto, but those of us here in Winnipeg wishing to attend can do so live thanks to a Zoom link, which uh, has been sent to many of you via email, but you'll also find that Zoom link for Bill Sturgis's funeral service on the Broadway First Baptist Church homepage uh, and also on the church events webpage. 
a recording of that service will also be available uh, in the webcast archives at York Minster's website, yorkminsterpark.com. There's an announcement in the bulletin today reminding us that annual reports for those serving in leadership in the church are due next week on May 15th. Next Saturday on May 13th, our church is hosting an event that we've not hosted for some time. It's a wedding shower. It's a wedding shower. This is in celebration of the pending nuptials of Shannon Weeb and Quentin Gowler. You are invited to come and extend your best wishes to them anytime between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. on that Saturday. And there's a bridal registry to help you extend your generosity to them as they plan their covenanted life together. That may be found by going to bridalregistry.com and typing in Shannon or Quinton. I'm sure there aren't too many Shannons and Quintons getting married, that even if you just typed in their first names, it might come up. Yeah, let's all go and try that. I'm sure it'll come up. Of course, you could also just ask Leanne or Kent, since I'm sure that you've, been, you've just memorized the entire wish list that they've compiled, right? Please let Kent or Leanne or Ruth Thiessen or Amy Lowe know if you're planning to attend. I'm sure that has to do with food, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to call John Hunt up here for a penultimate announcement, if you would. So the lights, you've noticed a little bit of a difference here. We had to move some pews forward and we had to move some pews back and that is to accommodate scaffolding to replace that light bulb. And then up in the balcony, we moved two pews back so that we can put up smaller scaffold. I say we <laughs> in that so far as we're hiring people to do it, to put up a smaller set of scaffolding for this set of lights here, or not that, uh, the, these two. <laughs> Also, I thought this would be, make an interesting display. You can see the evolution of the light bulb. So, I like these two the best because I like archival stuff. Kevin found this one uh, about a year ago and decided he better hang on to it. This is what is supposed to be up there. This, oh, sorry, do you want me to hold it? I don't want you to drop them. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, what is in this light bulb here. So number one, expired. Number two, when Kevin tried to order this one about seven or eight years ago when Dylan did the swap out here, he had to order this. Now, me not knowing about that, the latest version is, are those two there. So this is, uh, this is what this is gonna look like. We are gonna try to put this one in and then we will use one of these other ones. So that's what you will hopefully not be seeing next week. So this should be done over the, over the coming week. Uh, we don't know what day they're gonna set up the scaffolding, but I've actually asked of them to delay removal so that it is uh, a hindrance to us and you can see what your money is being spent on if they leave them here next week. So let's <coughs> see what happens. It's exciting. Thank you so much, John. I just wanted to say a brief further word about um, Bill Sturgis, our former pastor, uh, in a note that um, was passed along through Susan. Pastor Bill's daughter, Barbara Bergstrom, writes us that the date of his service, the 12th of May, would have been her parents' 72nd wedding anniversary. She believes there are still some at Broadway First who will remember the party thrown for them in 1976 for their 25th anniversary. The 12th of May is also the 18th birthday of Abby, their eldest great-grandchild. And Barbara and her sisters are extremely grateful for all the cards and emails and phone calls and virtual hugs that they have received from friends and family around the world in memory of their dad, Bill Sturgis. He was truly one of a kind and touched so many people in so many ways over the course of his 98 years on earth. It's time for us to turn to worship. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 31, one of David's Psalms. In looking 
up the psalm in preparation for our worship today, I was struck by how many times other people in other parts of scripture from other times and places during the 1400 years or so during which scripture was being committed to paper referred to verses found in this psalm written by David with instructions that it be used for public singing. It's one of the brutally honest psalms, the kind where David feels trapped um, and really needs God to rescue him. It turns out Jonah quotes Psalm 31, and we can remember why from Sunday school, Jer um, Jonah literally being swallowed up by a crisis. And the refugee, Jeremiah, quotes this Psalm six different times. Paul quotes him, and our brother and Lord quotes this Psalm before giving up his life on the cross. This plea is made based on a relationship, a recognition of God's past faithfulness in sustaining us thus far on our journey, as he has shown his love through the love of friends, through victories over temptation, through near misses from certain disaster. Let us, like so many before us, lean on David's words to express our openness to God's intervention in our lives. Let's pray together. In you, Lord, we have taken refuge. Turn your ear to us. Be our rock of refuge. And since you are our fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide us in this service and throughout this day and week. Our times are in your hands. Let your face shine on your servants here and refresh us as we open our hearts again to your unfailing love, as we pray in your Son's saving name. Amen. Let's turn now to worship in song, led by Mitch and Kent, Amy and Leanne. We begin with a hymn found in the Book of Praise in your pew hymnals at number 352.
morning. Thank you for joining us this morning and this has been a, a wonderful time of, of praise and worship so far and this worship set has really brought things brought things to me that that I really want to praise and thank God for. I want to um, introduce this time of prayer a little differently than what we've done before. What I'd like is to, I'll call it being an interactive. And as we pray for God's people, I want each of you to think of somebody special, somebody meaningful in your life that you believe could use prayer right now. I want you to bring to mind a friend or a family member, somebody who God has put on your heart this morning and I want you to pray together with me for this person. I believe that prayer is a very powerful way to bring God closer to us and for us to come closer to each other. So as we bow our heads, please take a moment and put that person or that group in your mind and we'll bow together in prayer. O oh Lord, you're beautiful. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning with praise and awe and wonder. And we also bring to you, Lord, our church family. Lord, we know that you are with us every day and everywhere that we go, through our good times and through our bad times. Through the times when we feel that we've got the strength to carry it through in the times when we feel that we've we've got no strength and we know that it's you that carries us through Lord this morning I bring to you each soul that is in mind in our congregation online as well as our congregation here gathered each person that is represented here and, and the souls that you've put on their minds, Lord, need you. And we pray, Lord, that you would come into our lives and, and bring to us the strength, the comfort, the love that only you can bring to us during these times. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together and we thank you for your son who has given us this opportunity to come to you boldly to the throne, Lord, that we could not only worship and praise you, but ask for your love and forgiveness. Ask for your grace and guidance to bring us together as a people, as your people, Lord, who love you and love one another. I pray, Lord, now for the greater community that we serve here in Wolseley. I pray for those who are struggling, for those who might feel that they're on the outside, Lord, that you would bring them in, and that through us and our lives and our gatherings together here would make them feel welcome 
and make them feel your love and join us as we praise and worship you on a regular basis. I also pray, Lord, for the government of our, our city as we go through difficult times, as we look towards electing new members, that you would be in that place and that they would hear your guidance and your voice as they make decisions for our community and our city. As well, Lord, I extend that to our province, our country, and to the world, Lord. We've just crowned a new king in the United Kingdom, and I pray, Lord, that you would be with him as he continues to lead under your direction and through your anointing. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us for the rest of our service today and that we would know your presence. We would feel your strength and your comfort and your love as we continue to worship and praise you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The scripture this morning is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 8 to 22. Finally, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whosoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Turn him away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered, once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's take a moment now and pray for Pastor Charlene as she brings us the message. <laughs> Dear God, we ask on behalf of our pastor that the meditations of her heart and the words that come from her lips be a blessing to us and pleasing in your sight. May they rekindle in us the fire uh, and the awareness of your blessing in our lives. For we pray this in your son's name. 
Thank you all for being patient as we read through quite a few verses this morning. Um, for me, I felt it was necessary to have that context for us to be able to truly understand what, what God has for us today. Call to be a blessing. In my uh, Bible translation, which is the New King James Version. The beginning of these verses has that title, Called to Blessing. And it, it meant to me that um, what we do here, our belief, the way we live our lives, is to be a blessing. But here, if we read through these verses, actually, if you read through, of course, the entire book, First Peter, which is a letter, and it's not very long, you'll see what he's giving to us is not only that this blessing that we bring to others is for their glory, it's also a blessing for us and for God's glory. And so, we look at, I looked at, first of all, Peter, who wrote this letter. Now, Peter is one of Jesus' original 12. So if we remember the story, if we can look back into the Gospels and we can see the story of where Peter was called. Peter was just living his life as a fisherman, doing his thing. In fact, he was, he was struggling, he was working hard to make ends meet, and maybe sometimes he was not quite as honest as he should be when it came to making those ends meet because he was under such pressure to, to provide for his family. So he was just in the middle of being and living his life when Jesus called him. And I thought, you know, that's just like us. In fact, it's just like me. I was just living my life. When I first gave my life over to Jesus, I was a teenager. And you know, as a teenager, everything in life is very important. In fact, everything in your teenage life is going to, as far as your teenage brain is concerned, affect the rest of your life, right? So everything you do has got to be perfectly done. And of course, as a teenager, you also need the respect and the approval of your peers. So that's what I was trying to do as a teenager. And being raised in the church, of course, you go to camp and I would go to camp every year. And the one year that everybody else that I was used to, all the, that hardworking, you know, peer approval, was kind of gone, and I found myself floundering, if you will, just like Peter was. And Jesus called me, just like he did to Peter. But Peter's not only that, you know, now he got called, and, and now, oh, everything's wonderful. I'm in the company of the Messiah. I'm part of the Jesus group. But he also had his doubts, as we also go through times of doubt. We know from the gospel story that even when it seemed that Jesus needed him the most, he denied him. As Jesus was being arrested and tried, Peter was outside denying that he even knew Jesus. So when it comes to who's writing these verses, it's somebody who knows what it's like to have a difficult life, who knows what it's like to be in good company, to be in the group, to be part of Jesus' chosen 12, but still having a hard time doing that. So he's writing this letter to other Christians, other believers, who are also suffering for their faith. In chapter 2, verse 8, he calls, he talks about just that. And he says, 
that what you are doing is, is stumbling for others. Verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. So it's not like these people, these believers, these Christians, are being persecuted for anything just randomly. In fact, they're being persecuted because of their belief, which is a stumbling block. It's a stumbling stone for others who, when they hear the truth, it kind of rings true, but they don't want to believe it for one reason or another. And they take it out on those of us who are believers. So you're being persecuted for those who are stumbling and blaming you. And in fact, Peter opens his letter by calling them strangers in a strange land, that we were meant for a better place, but here we are in our place and people are making it difficult. I, I stuck on the word strangers and reminded me of as a child growing up, and I'm not sure if this was across the board, but I know in school and my parents often taught me about strangers. You've got to beware of strangers. And so what is a stranger? Well, of course, a stranger is usually a tall, dark man, and he probably wears a hat, and he's probably got you know a trench coat or maybe even a cloak. He's a dark, stranger and you're supposed to stay away from these strangers because you know what strangers do for little children they kind of you know they have them for breakfast or they take them away and have them for dinner later on you know you've got to stay away from strangers because strangers are dangerous and so we have this idea in our mind about what a stranger is but what struck me about that is that the stranger was recognized by his activity. It's what the stranger would do that made him strange. And so that we can bring over to us as strangers in this world, in that our behavior is different than the world around us, that we are recognized by our strange behavior. As I was studying and, and reading my commentaries to to get some ideas on what, what these verses can say to us. One of the commentaries said that these verses are the most difficult verses in the Bible. Mm. Yeah, at first I kind of thought, wow, look at me. <laughs> but no, <laughs> it's not something to be really, um, it's not something that I want to, to make light of. But what I realize after reading them through a few times, it's not that it's difficult to understand, because we can understand what we're reading here. What makes it difficult is to be able to live it out. Mm. What, what Peter's asking us to do is not hard to understand. And it's fairly easy. It makes a lot of sense what are the things that he's asking us to do but it's hard to live out. And it starts almost right away in verse eight. Finally, all of you be of one mind. I'm just gonna stop there. Like-minded, everybody be of like mind. That's, that's hard to do in a family of three. <laughs> Never mind a, <clears throat> a community of believers. But I think, what we need to recognize here of like-minded, that he's not looking for uniformity. We don't all have to think exactly the same, exactly alike, but for unity. A little um, saying that I came across says, in fundamentals, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in everything, love. I think that's something that we can really take to heart, is that our fundamentals, the things that bind us together, our unity through Jesus Christ, but in everything we love one another. We can also see this in Galatians, Paul writes, 
the fruit of the Spirit. And of course, that's Galatians 5.22, which we can go back and look at. But in there, you'll see the same kinds of things that he's mentioning here in verse 8, of having compassion for one another, loving his brothers, tenderhearted and courteous. Gen Galatians talks about being gentle and kind and having peace. And so these are the things that we see are uniform across the Bible, the verses. What we're to do is to be gentle. What we are to come together in peace and love. In verse 9, verse 9 is what I really wanted to focus on, but we'll, you'll see that there's, this is kind of a, an opening into what we need to focus on here. But verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Again, it sounds really nice, doesn't it? You don't want to return evil for evil. You don't want to call somebody a name just because they called you a name. But is that hard? Really? Let's think about something like you get cut off in traffic. I don't know, I bless that person, of course. Go ahead. Yeah, I saw the sign a block away that said that lane is gonna end, and you decided that you're gonna wait till it's my turn to go, that you wanna take my turn. Blessings on you, fellow traveler. So yes, it sounds really easy, and it sounds like it's something that we should just be able to do naturally. But in fact, it's difficult to live out. And so this is where we first hear about the blessing, that you would be a blessing, knowing that you were called as a blessing to inherit that blessing. Now, I found it interesting, of course, that it's saying that you would receive a blessing but it's not, that's not the reason that we're blessing others. In fact, that's not the reason that our behavior is different or strange. But in fact, this blessing is to bless others so that others would see how Jesus works in your life, how Jesus works in my life, and that Jesus wants to work in all of our lives. And that blessing is to receive God's blessing. James 5.29, James is just right here, tells us something very similar. Brethren, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So we're doing this for others as well as for ourselves. That blessing that we receive is a blessing that we're bringing for others as well. Jesus taught this in his Sermon on the Mount that we read in Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, in verse 43 to 48. You've heard it said, that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. You shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. I found a couple more in the Gospels. In Luke chapter 6, verses 27, starting in 27. But I say to you, this is Jesus again, who here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. 
and from him who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. And of course, Paul tells us about this in Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So this is a, a common theme throughout the Bible in that we turn the other cheek, in that we don't return evil for evil because we have been forgiven, because we are a blessing and because we receive that blessing when we bless others. We carry on to verse 10, Peter quotes the Psalms. Again, as we've heard earlier this morning, that the Psalms are something that is very comforting, and it's something that we can use when we're finding ourselves in a difficult time. And this Psalm that Peter's quoting is from David while he was being hunted by his own son to take the crown from him. And he wrote, he who would love life and see good, day, good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. We're to be a blessing to others and that activity, that behavior is what will have us stand out to others. Verse 13, is like a reasoning. It's like Peter's reasoning for why we do this. Because if you think it through to the end, he says, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? So let's take a look at reality. If you're doing something good, who's really going to harm you? Who's really gonna come to you and say, hey, how dare you stop at the side of the road and help that guy with his flat tire? Nobody's going to do that. Or it's not very often that something like that happens. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, carrying on, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats or be troubled. Here he's quoting from Isaiah. And the idea here about their threats is that we know that we're saved, and we know that Jesus has overcome death, which is the worst threat that anybody could really give us, is the threat of taking your life. But we know that Jesus has saved our lives, and so no need to fear what they threaten us with, because we're doing the work of God, the kingdom of God, it's come near. And then, the most famous verse, I'm not sure if everybody's feeling that it's the most famous verse, but it's something that you hear a lot about when you hear the term apologetics. And it comes from this verse, verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. So again, we're looking at this strange behavior. Why is it that you're doing this good deed? Why is it that you're doing things that don't really line up with the way we do things in our world? And the reason is because of Jesus. Because Jesus has forgiven and died for me and my sins, and I live in that freedom of not being condemned by God, and you can too. This apologetic is what's called your witness. This is a reason that you have to give to others that they can hold on to. It's what causes you to bless others because you share your blessing with them. It's an opportunity to witness, and don't miss out the rest of the verse, with meekness and fear, or the NIV says, with gentleness and respect. We're not hitting people over the head with the Bible, but we're being gentle and we're being open to knowing that they're hurting just like we were hurting and that Jesus 
can come and bring them out of that hurt, just like he did for us. This is the strange behavior that people will see and ask us, why are you like that? Why do you do that? And it's for the glory of God. And this, verse 16, having a good conscience when they defame you to evil doers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ, they may be ashamed for their reviling. So this is another way that he's telling us that we're coming closer to God, that clear conscience that I'm doing things because I'm glorifying God, because I love others like he loves me. It made me think of one of the Old Testament verses that say, who could know the heart of a man? Because we can do things that on the outside looks shiny and new and nice, but on the inside, in our heart, there's some other reason that we're doing it, which, not, which would not be the greatest thing that people would know. But God knows our heart. God knows our conscience. And when we do things in his goodwill, we are doing that with a clear conscience towards God. So of course, all this examples and doing good instead of evil, the question is, where's the proof? How do we know that that's something that actually works? Verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit by whom he was raised. That is our ultimate proof, that Jesus come to earth, living as a human being like the rest of us without sin, but yet was punished for our sin. He was the just for the unjust, returning goodness for the evil that was in the world. That is our proof that Jesus would bring us closer, bring us in fact to God. And as we go on in verse 20, he talks about the days of Noah. And I think back, I mean, we could go back and, and read the story of Noah and the ark in Genesis. But if you remember, he was called by God, just out of the blue, you know, I'm going to flood the earth and you need to build an ark so you can survive. And of course, the people around at the time Maybe on a day like today when the sun is shining and there's not a cloud in the sky and there's that guy down the street who's starting to build a boat. What? You're building a boat? We're not even, there's not even a lake close by. Of course, they weren't here in Manitoba, the land of a thousand lakes, but, you know, he's doing something strange. He's doing something out of the ordinary because of his call from God. And when the rains came, he was prepared. He had the ark. And so even though he was surrounded by non-believers, he had an opportunity to tell them about his great God who is providing salvation for his people. And as we come to verse 21, that's what really struck me because as a a member of this Baptist church and most recently being part of a Baptist church but being raised in a Nazarene church, I often wondered what's, what makes Baptist different than what I was raised with. All our essentials, everything that I've learned and all the teachings in the Bible are exactly the same. We have the same belief system but when it comes to baptism, that's something that's, that's so very biblical 
And we find it right here that he talks about the baptism of the water. In the days of Noah, the water came and cleansed the earth and only eight people, he says, were saved. Only eight people were in the boat that God sent to save them. And even though the baptism of water is not about cleansing your outward body, it's not about taking a bath, it's not about being in the water. The idea is that this action of baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. Because what's happened inside is that God has forgiven my sins. He's washed away from the inside all the evil and all the doubts that keep me away from God. And I've come up in the life that Jesus has come up from his life after being crucified from the dead. And he comes up into life, into a new life with God and closer to God in that new, fresh way that brings us close to him. And so as a blessing, being called as a blessing and ending up in baptism really brings it together for me and makes me, of course, so very grateful for the opportunity to minister to this family here, but as well to be a member of the kingdom of God. And that Jesus has opened this way for not only me to be close to God, but for my life to be a blessing so that others would ask, how do you keep that smile on your face when it's pouring rain outside? How can you be so positive that things are gonna work out when it looks like the end? And as it says in verse 15, be ready to give a defense for how you stay so positive and how you stay so close to God. And my answer is Jesus. Jesus came and he took my sin, he took my shame, he took all the things that kept me away from God and he died, took it away. But thanks to God and his great glory, he brought him back and he brought me back and he brought all of you back and he brings us all back to him because that's where he wants us to be is with him so today i want you to remember that jesus took away that darkness that jesus brings us into the light and that we can be a light as a stranger and that light will attract those who are not used to it who don't understand it and I say have an answer be ready to be a blessing to others around you today and the rest of your time here with us amen We're now going to sing about the Father's blessing, about the Father's love for us. So if you'd like to join us as we sing together, how deep the Father's love for us.
And today, we have a very special activity that we're going to uh, engage in right now. I'd like to ask Dan, Betty, and Sean if you'd like to come forward. And I'll have Sheila join us as we welcome new members into our congregation this morning. It is a pleasure to welcome Dan and Betty Spurrow and Sean Duncan. At this point, while we put you together here as one unit, we know that each of you comes with your own strengths and experiences in life with different attributes that we look forward to getting to know more. We've had the pleasure of worshiping and serving with you over the past six-ish months mm -hmm. and getting to know you a little bit better. We're truly sorry that the reason you're here is because the closure of your church. But at the same time, we do feel your blessing and are excited for the things that you bring to us in our congregation. On behalf of the congregation of Broadway First Baptist Church, I want to extend officially our right hand of fellowship and may our time together be of mutual fellowship, learning, and growth. going to say a little prayer for my friends who have joined us here this morning. Pray with me. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself to save all mankind, we come today with praise on our lips and a petition in our heart. We praise you, O God, that Jesus died for us, that we may bring our lives to him in return. We are thankful for his servants here this morning, who offer themselves to the ministry of this church. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in their lives with us here together, and that we would be enlightened through the knowledge of your word, and that your hand would be upon their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And now that the supper of our Lord is spread before you, lift your minds and hearts above all selfish fears and cares. Let this bread and this cup be to you the witness and signs of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. I would ask you to join us a little closer to the front of the sanctuary. There's only a few seats at the front. We've made some arrangements, some changes, but we could, yeah, we could gather up together closer to the front. That would be wonderful. As we gather, let us remember that Jesus took his disciples aside and he gathered them for a meal. He took the bread and he took the wine and he shared it with his friends and he asked that we all remember him whenever we do this together. So I'll start by asking Susan to bless the bread. Let us join together in prayer. Lord, you are one bread and we who are many are one body for we all partake of the one bread. As we gather today, we give thanks for this bread, a symbol of Christ's body broken for us. We thank you with all our hearts for the great price you paid when you were crucified on the cross for us. As we take the bread representing your life that was broken, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to us and to all who will receive you. Thank you for your extravagant love 
an unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gave us life, abundant life now and eternal life forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is Jesus' body, broken for us. Take and eat in remembrance of him. Now Gay will come and pray for the cup. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, on this beautiful morning, together with our faith community and gathered here to remember, we give you praise and thanksgiving. That evening so long ago, your words, this do in remembrance of me, they echo down through the ages, surpassing everything else. We are so blessed to be here as those who have gone before us and those who will come after us, we truly give thanks for this cup. May we take the remembrance of this time in our lives in the week to come and we give you thanks and we remember. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. The cup represents the blood shed to cover our sins. 
Take and drink in remembrance of him. And even now that we have fellowship with this communion, let us live a life of gratitude for and constant communion with the gracious Father who is in heaven, not just today, but for the rest of our lives. We live in remembrance of him because he remembered us. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh.